Okay. I think, I think it's, it's time, time to start. start. Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. It's, it's my, my great, great pleasure, pleasure to, to introduce today our uh, this, this year's Rami Coach, Coach Medal of Science, of science um, in, in Social Sciences. sciences. As you know, every, every year, year we are circulating with uh, natural, natural science, science engineering, and medicine, and, and, and then other years, year, social sciences. sciences. So, so this year was about social sciences, sciences and yesterday night we announced our uh, awardee, uh, Professor Aisha Zarakol, Zarakol from uh, Cambridge, Cambridge University. University. Uh, so, so very, very briefly, she graduated, she graduated from the American, American High School, high school uh, from, from Istanbul, Istanbul, and then and she, she went, went to US for undergrad and PhD, and, PhD, and, and then, then, then uh, moved, moved to Cambridge, Cambridge, I think, how many years ago now? Nine? Nine? <laughs> ten. <laughs> ten years ago. And uh, so, so she, had she had a great, great talk yesterday, yesterday for general, general public, public. And, and today, today she, she will have, have more uh, detailed, detailed talk. talk. And you, you see, see all her prizes, prizes and she's, she's very, very productive, productive and she, she has, has many interesting books, books and articles that I highly encourage to read. And indeed, indeed I, I promise to our board of trustees that I will give you a latest book. <laughs> and we really <laughs> want you to sign them. I'll see if we can arrange it. Um, so, so she's, she's working, working on uh, uh, basically international, international relations, relations and, and historical, historical sociology fields in, in the intersection, intersection of these two fields. And you, and you will see, see more in detail. detail. I, don't I don't need to tell more about her, her research, research, but I'm, I'm very happy to have her here as the recipient. And I have, and I have a very, very small, small gift from my university for you. you. So uh, I'd like to give this before starting your talk. Uh, maybe we can come here for a picture. There will be conversation. Thank you, and let's have a talk. So thank you. Hello, Hello, everyone. everyone. Uh, it's, it's my, my great, great pleasure, pleasure to be here, here to be speaking to you. To you. And I'm, as, as I, I said, said last, last night, night, incredibly honored and privileged to be the eighth recipient, recipient of the uh, Coach, Coach Medal, Medal of, of Science, Science and the uh, first for uh, international, international relations. relations. So um, I, also I also accept, accept the medal, medal on behalf of my uh, uh, discipline. discipline. Uh, uh, Today, Today I will I talk, talk to you about, about my latest book, book uh, Before, Before the West, the West uh, and, and try, try to explain to you. I mean, I know not, not everybody here is in international relations. relations. I, will I will give the, the academic, academic talk, talk, my usual, usual book talk. talk. Uh, I, will I will try, try to, to explain, explain why I wrote the book and what, what kind of uh, problems I'm trying, I'm trying to address in the discipline and, and what are the, some of the new questions. questions. Uh, does the book Bring, bring up. up. Um, the, the, it, it was, was published, published before the West, the rise and fall of Eastern World Orders was published uh, March 2022, uh, and it has actually um, received uh, global interest. I've been going around uh, the world actually giving book talks, um, and hopefully. <laughs> Um, I, can I can also interest, interest you in some of the arguments, arguments uh, that, that the book, book makes. Now, now if, if you're an international relations student, student, you will notice, notice but for those from other disciplines, disciplines uh, one, one issue we have in international relations is that international relations operates with a very schematic, simplified uh, timeline of history. So if you pick up an international relations textbook, it, it will probably, probably have, have some discussion, discussion of the Peloponnesian, Peloponnesian Wars uh, in, in ancient Greece, Greece. Uh, because, uh, because uh, the, competition the competition between uh, Athens and Sparta, and Sparta is, is thought to rival uh, the Cold, Cold War, War competition, competition between uh, US and the Soviet Union. Union. So, so that's, that's in the textbook. textbook. Uh, it, it, so, so textbooks textbook will usually start, start there. there. 
and then they will jump to uh, 1648, uh, the Peace of Westphalia, which is the, uh, the treaties that concluded the Thirty Years' War. And then it, students are told this is when the modern international order was created in 1648, the modern principle of sovereignty was uh, recognized, uh, and, and it's, it's really, really after, after that, that that we have international relations. relations. And they will look at, you know, you know a, number a number of other events, like Congress of Vienna, Vienna after the Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, and, War II, and the Cold War. War. And, this and this is basically all the history that, that students get and are supposed to know about. In this, In this history, history, first of all, there isn't much room for anybody except European and Western states. states. Uh, and, and there is a general, general silence about uh, what uh, happened before 1648. So, so I, I think, think students tend to assume, to assume that, that nothing, nothing of importance uh, has, has happened, happened or, or importance to international relations has happened, happened before 1648. And, and if, if you're, you're studying, studying international, international order, order, which is one of the main issues, issues that international, international relations studies, studies as a, as a discipline, discipline, this history leads you to think that only once order was created in Europe, that's, that's what, what we call the Westphalian order, order. and then and from, from there, there it was uh, exported to the rest of the world. So it's, so it's only Europeans, Europeans that managed to order the world uh, globally, and this, this is what the mainstream, mainstream thinks. There are, of, of course, course, critical, critical scholars, scholars, like post-colonial post -colonial scholars, scholars, but they, but they often also operate with the same assumption. assumption. They're, they're, they just think, think it was a bad thing that, that Europe, Europe imposed, imposed this order. Uh, uh, the, the other side thinks, thinks it's a good thing, thing but, but nobody, nobody challenges, challenges that main narrative of order comes from Europe, from, from the West. West. And then and when, when we, we think about the rest of the world, we tend to think of it, and this is true, I think, for anyone, we tend, we tend to think, to think of the rest of the world, world in history uh, as existing in silos, uh, disconnected. disconnected. I mean, I mean if, if you think about Ottoman, Ottoman history, history, I'm sure you have, you have this impression that the Ottoman Empire, Empire conquers, conquers this place and that place, but it almost exists by itself, itself like in space, space right? right? Does, Does it, it have, have international, international uh, relations? Is it part, part of a larger system? system? We don't, don't tend to think of it that way, and, and uh, neither does anybody else. else. Same thing with China, China same thing with Russia, Russia same thing with... Uh, uh, and, and it's, it's only, only the, the modern, modern international, international order, order European, European that, that connect, connects, supposedly, these, these other, other parts, parts of the world. world. So this, this is uh, the, the narrative, narrative, the underlying, sometimes unstated assumption that I wanted, I wanted to challenge in this book. book. And why, why does, does it matter? matter? It, it matters, matters because international, international relations theorizes about, about the present, about, about what's, what's happening, happening now, now based on its understanding, understanding of history. history. It, it says, says certain, certain things happened in history, history. Uh, this, this allows, allows us to make uh, certain, certain kind of generalizations, of generalizations which, which apply, apply to the present. The present. So, so for instance, when Mearsheimer, a famous international relations scholar, scholar talks about Russia, Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine He's, He's not, not getting, getting his arguments from, from nowhere. He, he, he looks at his own understanding of history and comes, comes to certain conclusions. conclusions. Or when uh, Allison, Allison writes, writes about uh, the Thucydides trap, trap uh, essentially, essentially predicting, predicting that, that uh, the, the rise, rise of China, China will lead to conflict between the US and China, China. He's, he's again, again working, working from a certain, a certain understanding, understanding of history. history. So, it's so it's very important, important my, my argument, argument. <laughs> my, my argument, argument is that it's very important, important that, that we get, get the history right, right. That, that we don't, don't operate from a very limited slice of history. If we're going to make generalizations about how states behave, what happens to international orders and such. So in, in, in before the West, uh, what I wanted to do was to write a new history for international relations that did not center the West. And, and I, I wanted, wanted to also write uh, a connected history of the East uh, that, that did not uh, uh, privilege any one country. country. Because, because now, with China's, China's rise, there are some, there are some accounts, accounts that, that talk, talk about, about Chinese, Chinese history. history. But, but we don't, we don't really, really want, want to replace Eurocentrism with 
Sinocentrism. We, 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 we want to we want to have, to have uh, bigger, bigger global, global accounts. accounts. So that's, so that's what, what I'm trying, trying to do, uh, and, and that's, that's why, why uh, in the in book, book I start I with uh, the, the Mongol, Mongol Empire, Empire. Uh, yeah, or what, what I call the Empire of Genghis Khan. Uh, so, so you, so, you, so, so I, go I go back, back to the 13th, 13th century, and why is that? Because the, the Mongol, Mongol Empire, Empire, as, as you can, can see from this map, map uh, conquered much of the land mass, mass that we call Asia. Uh, it, it plays historically uh, a role in, in Asian history, history similar, similar to Roman, Roman Empire and European history, history. in the sense that we can see its traces, its institutions, its, institutions, its legacies, its legacies uh, across, across this, this whole space, space uh, for, for better, better or worse. worse. It's, it's a, a common, common experience, experience that, that we share, share that, that we share, share like, like people who are in Turkey share with people, people in China, China right? right? In, uh, in, in the uh, 13th, 13th century, the people, the people here had to deal with the same people as those people in China. And when you have a moment like this, when all of the space is unified under the same uh, empire, that, that inevitably, inevitably orders, orders that, that space, space in a particular way. It connects it. Uh, and uh, actually, we do know this in the 13th century and in the 14th century, Asia was uh, intensely connected, much more than actually it would be later, uh, because we have accounts uh, of uh, travelers. So everybody will have heard about Marco Polo. You know, there are Netflix shows about Marco Polo. Uh, this is an Italian merchant uh, who uh, makes his way, arguably, all the way to China. Uh, but there is the general idea that Marco Polo, because we don't know much about what was happening in Asia at that time, uh, that some people think Marco Polo was like maybe like an astronaut going, <laughs> going to a place nobody had gone before. But what in reality, what I talk about in the book is that this type of travel is made possible only in a connected world uh, where the roots already exist, right? So he's using these uh, roots established by the ordered world. And there were other travelers uh, besides uh, Marco Polo, like Ibn Battuta, slightly later period, uh, somebody who starts his life uh, in Western North Africa and travels for many decades across Asia uh, and then goes back and writes his memoirs, which you can actually buy and read, uh, and they're quite interesting. Uh, but what's remarkable about his life is that he is able to find employment in all the cities he goes to as a jurist, Islamic jurist, and nobody is really surprised to see him you know, they, they want updates from the previous place he came from. Uh, and what I'm arguing in the book is that that's only possible in a world kind of like ours, an ordered, a connected world. Like, I'm able to start my life's journey uh, in Istanbul, then go to the US, then I go to the UK. You know, I've done visiting fellowships in Australia. All of that is possible because globalization and the modern international order has ordered our world in a way that is translatable, where my credentials carry some weight here and there, and it's already a connected world. So the Mongol Empire did something similar in the 13th century. It connected the world, it ordered the world. It took people from one side of the continent and put them in the other. Uh, it took materials and goods and know-how and technology and science and disseminated not necessarily, it's not their invention, but there, there was such human resources under their control, they helped its dissemination. Uh, a good example is uh, the dumpling, or what we call mantı in Turkish. Uh, so this is not my map, but I use it because it's illustrative, because every place that was under the control of the Mongol Empire plus Italy, because they were very much <laughs> hooked into this system, uh, there is a version of Mante. <laughs> uh, so, the, the, so, I mean, that's a very simple thing that they spread around. Also, hard liquor, but anyway, we, we won't get into 
the food stuff, because my book is not about that, but just to give you a sense of what empires do, how they disseminate stuff. What I'm interested in the book uh, is the dissemination of something else. Uh, you could call it an idea almost, a way of thinking about the world. Uh, institutions and norms, which is what uh, international relations scholars and political scientists study. Uh, and what I'm arguing is that the empire spread a particular understanding of sovereignty, what we call sovereignty, uh, in Turkish, egemenlik, but you could also call it a uh, notion of state, you know, the, a particular style of governance. Uh, which is different from what we have now. So what we have now is the nation-state model, right? That's the basis of uh, modern sovereignty. Uh, and what they had was something else. Uh, their understanding of sovereignty was about extreme centralization of power and authority uh, to the extent that one person is at the top of everything and is also the lawgiver. Uh, now, you may think that's not so unusual in history, but it is actually quite unusual, especially by the 13th century, because this is a sovereignty model, an understanding of the state where the ruler is not accountable even to God or uh, to holy books, right? He's above it all. Genghis Khan was above it all. He was the ultimate lawgiver. Uh, almost a god on earth, uh, and uh, that went hand in hand with the expectation that he was a world conqueror. So this, this sovereignty model, what we find, wherever it's repeated, wherever it's emulated, very, very strong rule coupled with dreams and sometimes realization of universal empire or, or almost near universal empire. Uh, and we're not talking about a world of uh, nation states, as I said. Uh, what the political units that are really operating in this world are houses. So it's the house of Genghis and others. They are the ones that are having international relations. I mean, of course, the word international has the word nation in it, so it doesn't make a good fit for this time period. Uh, so, a better way of thinking about this inter-house relations, or I say instead of international order, I say world order. These houses are ordering the world. And uh, they are kind of like the great powers of our day. And that's why, even though this is historical material, it should be of interest to international relations scholars today, because there's something recognizable to us uh, about the way uh, they operate. So the, the book tries to, uh, well, not tries, it traces uh, three successive Eastern world orders organized by this sovereignty principle, uh, centralization, universal empire. Uh, the first one is the Mongol Empire or the world empire of uh, Genghis Khan. Uh, in, in Mongolian, it's Mongol, Yeke, Ulus. Uh, some words are uh, recognizable. Then uh, it breaks into four khanates. Uh, so they have different names in different parts of the world because uh, later historiographies have given them different names, but they were actually uh, more or less organized around the same lines. So modern day China, uh, Yuan, Ulus, Central Asia, Chaatai, Ulus. Russia, sometimes called Golden Horde, but uh, Joshit Ulus, and then the Ilkhanet, or Hulagi Ulus, that's the Middle East. These are different branches of Genghis' family. And uh, there, is, there are periods of fighting, but this period is also known as Pax Mongolica, and there were uh, a lot of uh, many trade relations, and the whole world, also even beyond this space, was organized according to the principles uh, that the house of Genghis actually imposed. Uh, so that's one chapter. I won't get into the details. If you can, I can explain more in uh, Q&A. Then uh, in the next chapter, I move into 
what I call the post Chinggisid world order. Uh, so that looks at uh, that chapter looks at the time period between uh, end of 14th century uh, to about mid 15th century, uh, and I put together two great houses that are normally not studied together. Uh, so the Timurids, Timur, who we are more familiar with from our own history, also the Ming Dynasty in China. Uh, and I argued that they were actually part of the same order because they were all uh, influenced by this uh, Chinggisid model of sovereignty, centralized, interested in universal recognition, and they were competing with each other. In fact, uh, Timur died on his way to, uh, in an attempt to conquer China, but they also had diplomatic relations, exchange of gifts, and they were competing with each other for control of uh, Central Asia. So that was, I argue, similar to the Cold War, you know, <laughs> the competition between US and Soviet Union both are kind of legacies of the European imperial period and bear some resemblances, but they're also rather different from each other. Uh, and that's another world order that I discuss. And then uh, in chapter four, uh, I come into 15th, uh, late 15th and 16th century and focus on what I call the post-Timurid world order. So after the Timur, uh, Timurid Empire fragmented, uh, there was a huge influx of intelligentsia and artists and all sorts of people into the area that is called the Middle East, including uh, Anatolia uh, and uh, the Ottomans, but also the Safavids and later the Mughals were very much actually uh, influenced uh, by Timurid notions and Chinggisid notions of sovereignty uh, and therefore uh, acted in ways uh, that fit uh, the model that I've described. So again, you know, we think of Ottoman Empire, not just us, but also everybody thinks of maybe the Ottoman Empire as an Islamic empire, but uh, the way that uh, um, the sultans from Fatih uh, to uh, Kanuni, the way that they're acting, the way that they're imposing their will over the ulema, over the, uh, uh, the, ju the jurists, that's more in the uh, Chinggisid mold, right? They are especially Kanuni, like why does he have that title? Because he is the lawgiver. That means, in a way, he's above uh, Sharia, right? So uh, it's not just the Ottomans. The Safavids uh, have a similar dynamic. The Mughals, especially, you know, Akbar the Great. Uh, they're not acting very much like proper uh, Muslim sultans, uh, and they are very much in competition with each other uh, for universal empire. And the argument that I'm making in that chapter is that uh, if you lived in the 16th century, I mean, you may have a notion that, yes, Europe, Europe's fortunes are improving. But if somebody asked you, like, where is the center of the world? Uh, the center of the world was in that uh, circle because these three empires plus the Uzbeks, which I don't talk about as much, unfortunately, they controlled, you know, uh, much of the world's trade, a third of the world's population, much of the world's uh, you know, economy, they, they were ordering the world. Uh, and the Ming in China still carried Chinggisid influences. The, the Russians in Moscow also very much, you know, they had just become free of uh, Mongol rule, so they also very much were influenced by these same principles. And uh, the Habsburgs in, uh, in Europe, uh, they are kind of also tra are transformed uh, by these ordering principles coming from the East because they're in competition with the Ottomans. Uh, so uh, much of the Habsburg behavior in 16th century 
actually also resembles uh, the Chinggis sovereignty model because Charles is competing with Suleiman, so he's copying his behavior. So many things that have been studied in European history as European inventions are actually coming as a result of their coming into the European timeline as a result of their competition uh, with the East. And that's, that's the story I ch tell in the next chapter, chapter five. Uh, we tend to think that influence has gone only one way from West to East, because we only look at relatively recent history. If you go far enough, far back enough, influence has gone East to West, of course, North, South, you know, the world is connected, so it's never uh, only one way. So these four uh, chapters essentially are looking for the same kind of package in different time periods and different uh, houses, different empires. Uh, and I am able to show, I think, that some of the general principles of understanding the world uh, attached to these very different empires with different religions and different, uh, you know, geographies were nevertheless influenced by this earlier experience. So, uh, as I said, the basic notion of Chinggis sovereignty, but a number of secondary influences, secondary institutions we also find uh, in all of these empires. So an interest in astronomy, uh, sponsorship of uh, study of skies, that comes from the Mongols. I can explain why it has to do with their uh, belief system. Uh, tanistry, uh, this is this is, a, this is something you will know from Ottoman history. So instead of the first son inheriting the throne, the Mongols had a model where any member of, uh, male member of the family could vie for rule. And this often ended in you know, people killing their brothers, uncles, uh, interregnum periods. Uh, and it seems, from the European perspective, it seems disorderly and senseless, perhaps even barbaric, but there is a, a logic to it within this world order. Uh, if your goal is to select for a world conqueror, if, you're, if the, the ruling person has to be a world conqueror, how do you select for a world conqueror? <laughs> you need to select somebody who can conquer even their own family, right? So it, in, in this world, it is a rational kind of succession. Uh, system. Hunting gardens, uh, um, a general promotion of uh, cultural pluralism. By this I mean because in the Chinggisid model the ruling family sees themselves so above everybody else that they had relatively uh, low levels of interest in micromanaging the belief systems of the subjects. Uh, again, this varies by time period, but you can see, especially compared to the European model, uh, all of these empires I've discussed are much more pluralist when it comes to, uh, you know, rituals and religion and practice and that sort of thing. And promotion of trade, again, the Mongols were very much into promotion of trade. Uh, they repaired what's called the Silk Road. They uh, had regular stops along it. You can change horses. They sponsored, you know, they, the trade was a big factor and we can see uh, the, its influences in successor states as well. Again, I am happy to uh, discuss more. So by doing so, by extending IR history in this way, uh, I am able to fill this blank space. So what international relations teaches its students is just that, part of the slide. Uh, this is the story that we've been telling, and I'm able to add many more orders that we can study uh, to that account and connect the previous orders to the traditional IR account as well. Now, when I give this talk uh, in India, Australia, etc., sometimes I get the question, what about other places or other time periods, you know? What about our orders? <laughs> and it's, it, is, it is true. I mean, it's, I'm not saying this finishes the story. Of course, there are other stories in other time periods. You know, another account could emphasize Islam more. You know, we could look at Africa, all of that. So this is also a partial account. But uh, 
it's still better than, I would say, the one that we had been operating with. And what is the benefit of doing this? What, what happens when we expand our historical knowledge, our historical imagination? Uh, I mean, it's just, it means, as I said in the outset, it, we can theorize better. So, uh, one of the problems that international relations is very interested in is in this issue of like decline, rising and declining uh, powers. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've only studied, the discipline has only imagined until very recently, it's only that great powers can rise and decline. Uh, that's what we call uh, in international relations, kind of a level of analysis problem. Like, we've only focused on one level of analysis, but we could study decline at other levels of analysis. So, uh, recently, the liberal international order is in crisis, but it, it hadn't been even possible to imagine that an international order could go into crisis, that it could stop expanding, because international relations had only studied European history. If you look at my account, you can see that is quite possible. And then I also introduce in the book another level of analysis, what I call ecumene, which is a word similar to uh, civilization or maybe cosmology. Uh, and I'm arguing that beyond the international order, there are deep norms that connect successive international orders. So, we know, for instance, the 19th century European imperial order. It's not like exactly like ours, but there is a continuity between the 19th century order and what we have now. Um, the nation uh, state model, for instance, emerges in the 19th century and is still with us. But it's possible to have decline even at that level. So in the account that I've given you, you know, uh, the, you know, the notion of being connected to, for instance, Chinggis, Genghis Khan was so powerful for centuries. It was something that really ordered that world. Even the Byzantines were, you know, trying to marry into uh, that family. The Mamluks were trying to get uh, uh, Genghis princesses. Uh, everybody, because if you were somehow connected to Genghis Khan, that gave you almost like a claim uh, to rule. And that was a belief, a very deep norm, that people across Asia shared for centuries and centuries. And then lost, gone, almost completely forgotten in everywhere except maybe like some pockets of, I don't know, uh, Mongol nationalists or something. Uh, but something that was so powerfully operating and organizing politics disappeared, right? So that can happen also in our world. The things that we take for granted, that organize the way we live, you know, another century, and they may not be organizing the world at all. So that's what I'm trying to um, remind international sc uh, relations scholars of. The book uh, draws our attention. I mean, it's, it has something to say about great powers, but it draws our attention to other levels of analysis uh, and how decline can happen there. Uh, and just give, let me just give you an example of how that happens. Um, my three orders are punctuated. They come to ends with periods of crisis. So uh, the Mongol period, I'm sorry, just need comes to an end, uh, 14th century crisis it's called. Uh, we don't exactly know the causes, but uh, Black Death, the plague is like spreading, so that brings the end of a uh, number of dynasties, so potentially that's one of the explanations. There's a mid 15th century crisis that's felt particularly acutely in West Asia. Again, historians speculate as to the reasons, but one of the explanations is that there was a contraction of precious metals, uh, which really disrupted overland trade. Uh, and that seems to be underlying, uh, you know, because Europeans, well, West Asia and Europe were sending money 
to China to buy like Chinese porcelain and so on. And this was much of global trade. And then trade, you know, there's no money <laughs> to pay. Uh, and, you know, trade is uh, disrupted. So that uh, is another crisis period that fragments that order. But those are relatively short crisis periods. My, the historical account in my book comes mostly to an end with the general crisis of the, 15th, of the 17th century, which is a much longer, prolonged period of crisis and disruption. Uh, and that has a number of explanations uh, as well. Historians have, European historians especially, have been studying the general crisis of the 17th century for a long time because they've known for Europe 17th century was incredibly messy. Thirty Years' War, uh, English Civil War, and all of that. But now we know uh, from other regions that 17th century was really messy elsewhere too. The Ottomans, the Jelali rebellions, uh, time of troubles uh, in Russia, uh, you know, dynastic change and rebellions in China. There's something everywhere. And... Uh, you know, there had been exp like explanations based on uh, economics or politics when historians thought this was a European thing. Uh, but what historians now favor is the climate uh, change explanation, uh, which also actually figures into the explanation of previous crises. Uh, perhaps because we are in a period of climate change, we're seeing, we're more inclined to see climate change in historical periods as well, we pay more attention to it. But we do know that the 17th century for the Northern Hemisphere uh, was a time of uh, peak cooling. Uh, and it's the coldest period of a longer cold period known as uh, the Little Ice Age. Uh, this, is, this lasts almost a century, and you will know from European paintings, maybe. Uh, like everybody's ice skating in the Netherlands. Uh, this is that period. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's still cold in Europe, but you know, it was especially cold. Uh, and uh, and they, they think, historians think, that this is what's underlying uh, many of the political uh, and economic problems uh, in the 17th century. What I argue in, this, in the book is that it's not so much the climate change that brought the end of Eastern world orders, but this period of tumult, chaos, caused everybody kind of to turn inward, and they stopped. Not only trade was disrupted, but uh, even competition, uh, rivalry was disrupted, because everybody was trying to deal with their own rebellions and so on. There wasn't much international left. And that's what really fragmented and frayed uh, the existing order, uh, which had been dominated by uh, the East until then. But of course, structural pressures are only part of the story of you know, what causes orders to decline. The other thing that I point attention to is in the, in the book and in my other recent work is Every order has a legitimating principle, a story it tells about itself, certain promises that it makes. And when that stops, or when it, cannot, it, no long, it can no longer deliver on that promise and cannot really get by by kind of faking it, that's when the order runs into a uh, legitimating, legitimation crisis. So the Chinggisid orders that I study, again, you will know this from your uh, Ottoman history lessons, because it was built on the promise of world empire, as soon as these empires stopped expanding, even if economically they were doing well, uh, they ran into kind of a legitimation problem. Because some people, at least, not everybody, but some people would stop, start saying, we're no longer conquering, we must be declining, right? So their measure of decline their understanding of decline was based on what was promised and what no longer being delivered. They weren't saying, oh, I'm still wealthy. Who cares if we're no longer conquering? It's part of uh, the ordering principle. Uh, so, you know, the f a good example of this is 
the four Mongol Khanates, they coexisted quite peacefully, and they were, it, trade was good, economically they were doing well, but none of them, you know, you cannot have four world empires. Uh, so there was this sense of, we are declining. Uh, similarly, the liberal international order promises certain things uh, about liberalism, inclusion, equality, etc. When it cannot deliver on that, or when it so contradicts its own promises, even if economically people are doing well, there is the sense of, oh, we must be declining, right? So there is a normative angle, perception angle to decline that's independent of uh, material uh, factors. Finally, I'm almost uh, at the end. Uh, what I, I have a last chapter in the book, uh, uses and abuses of macro history, or am I a Eurasianist, where I look at some of the pitfalls and dangers of doing this type of macro history, where it could go wrong, and maybe some of the real world politics of doing macro history. And, uh, you know, because we are in a discipline, international relations, political science, uh, that has real world, you know, political implications. Uh, we need to be, uh, you know, careful about uh, the, the narratives that we put in the world. So I wanted to really grapple with that uh, in this chapter. And what's important to me, I mean, one of the, I discussed many things in that epilogue, but what's important to me is that people take away from the book, uh, not only the idea that we should get away from, uh, um, Western centricism, uh, but also that, you know, that we have, our ancestors have uh, many shared experiences with other people in other parts of the world uh, that transcend both national and religious lines. Uh, so that's what's important to me. If we can recover some of those shared connected histories, I think that could be the basis of uh, a better uh, future as well. And I deal with some of those issues in a more recent article, remembering the shared history of Eurasia. Uh, I'll stop there. Um, and uh, thank you for listening, and thank you uh, for the award once again. Thank you very much for a very inspiring book and presentation. Um, in the beginning of your presentation, you started with the challenge of also trying to understand today and also to a certain extent to predict the future. And based on this analysis, for instance, with your examination of the 17th century, <laughs> a lot of the things you mentioned, climate change, economic crisis earlier in the 14th century pandemic, are in so many ways reminiscent of the tremendous uncertainty and disruptive change that the world is experiencing today. Yeah. So what does this analysis mean for the current world order or orders uh, and their future? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Shuf uh, Lozoja, for that great question. Actually, I now, at the moment, so this is kind of the question that I ended the project with, and then I applied for funding and I got funding from the British Academy to study disorder because uh, once I learned about the extent of, you know, we all have a sense of the 17th century, but it's kind of fragmented. But once I learned the extent of uh, the 17th century general crisis and how it was felt acutely everywhere, uh, I started thinking that the 17th century is a much better maybe analogy for the 21st century than uh, periods in more recent memory, in the 20th century, for instance, uh, because there is this expectation, you know, we all know we are going through a period of transition, but I think there's an expectation that it will be relatively short-lived, and quickly a new order will emerge, and maybe China will dominate that order, or it will be bipolar, like it will be a new Cold World order. And that is possible. But it is also possible when we look at longer durée history to see the 17th century, a period of longer, prolonged disorder. 
uh, where nothing was really disordering disorder, uh, the world. And as I said, everybody's kind of uh, everybody's dealing with their own problems and not really trying to maintain anything at the global level. Uh, and I think, you know, the conditions for that are there because just for like the 17th century, you know, there's climate change, there's uh, technological change, uh, you know, with AI and so on. There are financial crises, demographic uh, disruptions, uh, and then of course, in, on top of that, you know, wars and etc. Why does it, you know, it's kind of depressing to think of it that way. At the same time, it is a scenario, a scenario we need to consider because we find comfort in the fact that sooner or later things will get ordered. Maybe we need to prepare ourselves within the vessels that we find ourselves in for a more uncertain, disorderly uh, future. Now, order, of course, will re-emerge, you know, it always does, I mean, if history is of any guidance, unless we completely annihilate ourselves, you know, some kind of order will emerge, but it doesn't have to be immediate, right? It could be, it could be turbulence for many decades instead of just one decade. And we need to prepare for that worst case scenario. I think that's what uh, the 17th century teaches us. Um, thank you for the uh, very interesting presentation. And I was wondering your uh, your opinion about uh, your or your work's effect on uh, how we look at uh, today's world. And uh, I I had an idea about uh, how we see the more eastern states, uh, as in uh, maybe uh, Russia and Turkey mm -hmm. and India and China, yes. in the sense that there are more um, centralized yes. political systems and. Uh, I think we generally have a perspective uh, that they are uh, they are not Western because they fall short of liberal world order values. Uh, but can we maybe look at them uh, in the sense that they are uh, they're more centralized systems or mm -hmm. their different yeah. uh, understandings are maybe the remnants of these Eastern world yes. orders? Or? Yeah, that's that's a really good question too. Um, so I think centralization. This type of centralization, it's kind of almost transhistorical. It happens in different time periods, in different time, uh, in different places. So I don't think it has necessarily has a geography to it. But it's, of course, always resisted, right? Because, you know, <laughs> um, I mean, we have good reasons to resist. I mean, there are advantages to centralization as well. Uh, so if somebody can su successfully centralize, uh, that has an impact, you know, because of, it, because of the resistance. So what uh, Genghis Khan was able to do uh, to successfully centralize, create a world empire. Uh, so that had a huge influence as a story, as a myth, as a kind of a justifying myth in Asia. So people were always using him, not only him, but especially him, his example. Uh, so it, it's important as a narrative in Asian history. The other reason why that period is important in Asian history is on the way to centralizing, uh, the Mongols killed off a lot of uh, secondary houses. So, you know, in, in this world, regular people, like peasants and so on, they have no agency, they're not able to do really anything. Uh, they're kind of like cattle. Uh, it's, the resistance comes from other aristocratic houses. So when they're destroyed, when they're killed off, that means like a source of resistance is removed from the geography uh, for a long period. Whereas Europe, you know, they never conquer Europe. Europe remains fragmented politically. That means there are lots of little houses running around with their, like, I have rights, listen to me. You know, and that is what makes it possible later to expand those rights more easily to the regular, uh, you know, regular people. Uh, so in Asia, that like middle layer, not completely removed, but uh, much more damaged in recent uh, memory. So 
both because of the historical example and because of the historical sociological phenomena of what the con conquest did, and also with the later conquests of the other empires as well, centralization finds easier, like more fertile soil, I think, on this side rather than on the other side. Now, this is not deterministic. I think uh, just the centralization is almost transhistorical and you know, leaders, if they can centralize, they will. Resistance, I, I think, is also quite, it's not owned by any geography. People will resist if they can, if they have the means, if they have hope. So I think that's true for uh, Asia as much as for Europe as well. Thank you for the speech, Ojem, and congratulations on the award. Uh, so I was uh, wondering, I mean, your addition to uh, IR is very valuable, obviously, uh, but the field itself is a post-Westphalian field mm -hmm. uh, aimed at solving post-Westphalian issues in the world. Uh, so uh, would adding a non-Western historical IR to the field, uh, make, the f uh, make the field maybe methodologically or theoretically inconsistent uh, in some sense. Mm. Uh, could you know, the theoretical instruments of uh, the discipline uh, remain feasible? Uh, yeah. That's the solution. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think, so yes, international relations in some ways, I wouldn't even call it post-Westphalian, it's a post-19th century uh, field, it's a modern field. In some ways, it is very much a product of even the name international, right? It's like 20th century modernity, kind of. But I think it, at, the, at the heart of it, like we need a field, we need a discipline that studies the whole world with everything in it. In my mind, international relations should be that discipline, should be that field. And in order to do that, what we need to do is go back and rethink our foundational concepts. Like, what is a state? Like, what is order? Uh, uh, what are dynamics that we find everywhere? And what are dynamics that are specific to uh, time, like specific geographies, specific cultures? Uh, and then we can actually think about the whole world uh, more consistently. So. I guess my answer is both yes and no. Uh, <laughs> international relations needs to change, but that's not just because I'm saying so or because it's uh, Eurocentric. It's like the, the world is no longer the 20th century world. So the discipline needs to catch up uh, with the times. And I think the 21st century will be much more like the historical periods we don't study than the 20th century one that we are exiting. Could I? Yes, yes. Uh, so, and I, I, was I that was a also, setup? <laughs> no, 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 definitely. Uh, I was also, maybe in connection with that question, I was also wondering how your interactions with critical IR scholars have been like since the book's publication. Uh, maybe it's not the Achilles heel or something of uh, that subfield, but uh, positively reconstructing IR rather than yes. uh, criti critiquing uh, Western IR is. Uh, something that's very ambitious to me, maybe since Hobson or something. Yeah. Uh, how, you, how have they responded to your book? Yeah, I mean, I think John and I are uh, very uh, sympathetic on this. Uh, I mean, I, I, of course I have sympathies with uh, you know, critical IR as well, but I, I, my personal feeling was uh, A, critical IR had made its point, but it, you, at some point you have to move away from critique and offer alternative ways of looking at the world. And two, that the criticism itself is rather Eurocentric because, you know, it's, you know, seeing everything through as a product of European colonialism is in its, itself, you know, whether you're saying that's good or that's bad, it's like this is still the same uh, kind of, like we need to get away from, uh, as they say, like provincialize. I mean, not, it's not that Europe isn't important or the West isn't important, but we can't only be focusing on that uh, in our congratulations or complaints. We need to study other parts of the world uh, as well. I mean, there's so much that's been neglected. So, in general, I get along with my critical IR colleagues, but I guess at some point we <laughs> part companies. I mean, I was just giving 
uh, a similar talk in Germany, and I, I was asked a similar question, and I said, you know, in Turkish we have a saying, is the goal to eat grapes <laughs> or to, uh, it was very funny when I, you know, translating it's very funny, but that's the point. I mean, like, the point is to eat grapes, I think, not to beat up the barge. Yeah, so that, that's my take on that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, well, everybody defines it differently, but I have my definition here in my notes, so I will read it to you. I didn't get into it. Uh, so, I define world order, this is from the book, as the man made rules, understandings, and institutions that govern and pattern relations between the actors of world politics. A world order is more deliberately created or designed by its various actors and more reflexively maintained or undermined than structure. So what I make a distinction in the book, this is not always a distinction that's always made in IR, between order and structure. So order is man-made, not always in the way it's, you know, the results are not always what people intend, but it's man-made. Structure are things that we don't control uh, through agency. So, uh, you know, climate or, I don't know, economics sometimes. And then I, I made the point in the book that what's structure and what's order has changed over time. Certain things that were structural, like disease, became more controllable, more subject to our agency, and more ordered. Uh, yeah, so, um, and that's the difference between when I said structural crisis versus legitimation crisis. Legitimation crisis is like a, an order crisis. The story of the order no longer works, whereas structural stuff is things you cannot really control beyond your agency. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for this work. It's a great contribution. I will put for sure in my syllabus for next time. <clears throat> as a historian, I would like to ask that and, uh, you know, uh, as you said, historians like to use uh, the rise, the fall, or the decline mm -hmm. of the, for example, Paul Kennedy's book, The Rise and the Fall of uh, Great Powers. Uh, but when talking about the Ottoman Empire since Halil Inalci Koca, mm -hmm. they are not talking anymore yes. about the decline. Yes. They rather prefer terms like transformation or know, other yeah. terms. Yeah. What would you think about this? Yeah, I agree, actually. Um, and I've used, you know, there, there is a lot of, not just in the Ottoman his history field, but uh, in recent decades there's been uh, challenges to the Eastern decline, like Chinese decline, you know, all of the decline narratives in these, these different contexts uh, have been challenged. Uh, and that was actually, that's one of the things I'm trying to address in the book. If materially, like the Ottoman Empire did not really decline in the 18th century as much as we think it did, if the historians are right. Or like China, right? The Great Divergence uh, happens really in the 19th century. 18th century China under the Qing, they're expanding. They're like, they're growing in size. Economically, they're doing fine, right? So if all of that is true, it's like, why is it that in the 19th century, all of these Asian countries become convinced that they had been declining for centuries and centuries? Um, so that was one of the puzzles in the book that I was trying to address. And one of the answers I give is that they didn't economically decline, but they lost the ability to order the world, right, socially and in other ways. Uh, and that created a sense of loss, I think, that, that predates uh, material. Uh, so that transformation came with a sense of uh, loss. Uh, anyway, there's a greater discussion of that in the book, and also I have a big takedown of <laughs> Kennedy uh, in, in in chapter four uh, that uh, people have enjoyed, let's say, <laughs> uh, so uh, of his of his treatment of uh, of Asia in that in that book as well. So I use the word, but I also challenge it. Right? I use the word because people think in those terms, but I also challenge. Uh, the concept of decline as well. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much. I missed the first part because I just came from the class, but maybe my question may not be as relevant. My question is about uh, starting with the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, the structure and the order seems to be getting uh, confused one regard because what you describe structure as something that yes. you cannot control, but technology now is now under the human's control mm -hmm. in that regard. Yeah. And there is a big difference across nations, in inequality across nations increases, and whereas that determines the power as the order as well. Yes. So, I mean, how does that, how does that influence your prediction? Future versus the past. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. I mean, that's the story of modernity. I mean, maybe it goes back even before the industrial revolution. Like, so we have the sense we start believing that we can control everything, right? And I, actually, in some ways, you know, you know, the belief in human agency greatly increases uh, uh, in modernity, uh, and. You know, in a, in a way, it's like a good thing because it allows us to make, you know, great leaps of progress in science and all of that. At the same time, I think in the 21st century, we're finding that, or maybe starting with the second half of the 20th century, we're finding that maybe we were a little too optimistic about the degree of uh, agency we have uh, over structural things like climate and, and so on. Uh, and then suddenly we're, that's what I meant, like the, the future may be more like the past in the sense that structure may be reasserting in ways that we cannot order or predict or control. And that's maybe we need to, of course, it's not going to be exactly like history. You know, we're not going back in time because we, that never happens. What comes will be a hybrid of various things. Uh, but at least we can learn from history, like how do people cope with uh, a world where not only agency may be constrained by structure, but people no longer maybe have the same trust and faith in their agency, right? That's another problem. That's the other uh, part of it. But yeah, thank you. Great question. Thank you.